Aston Martin DBS. Arguably the most iconic car ever featured on the big screen, James Bond's Aston still hides many secrets only the biggest fans know about. For over 60 years, there has been no other vehicle used on screen that has had quite the long-lasting effect as James Bond's Aston Martin DB5. It has captured the imaginations of generations and counting as it continues to dominate our cinema screens in a gloriously lavish fashion. Bond was initially let down when his Bentley 3.5 liter, seen in from Russia with love, was replaced by the DB5, but after his outings in Goldfinger and Thunderball 1964 and 65, his mind was permanently changed, and the Aston Martin developed a bigger cult status than any other prop in the Zubero 7 franchise. You will, of course, remember it for its silver birch paint finish, ejector seat, Q wasn't joking, front-mounted machine guns, tire slashers, and numerous other famous gadgets. However, there are some facts about the famous Aston that you may not be aware of. Here's a list of 10. Despite being labeled everywhere as a DB5, the car used on screen in Goldfinger that boasted all the fancy gadgets wasn't a DB5 at all. The effects car with the chassis number DP2161 was a very late iteration of the DB4, known as the Series 5. It was originally finished in red and served as the DB5 prototype for Aston Martin, before it was given to the Bond producers to equip it with the famous gadgets. That car was registered with the famous BMT 216A plate, whereas the second car used, which was a production DB5, was registered FMP7B. But it wasn't like the average onlooker could tell the difference as the late DB4s and DB5s looked exactly the same. In the Goldfinger novel by Ian Fleming, Bond was using an Aston Martin DB MK Aichi, which he chose over a Jaguar 3.4, presumably an MK1 saloon. When it came to plan the filming of Goldfinger, the production team naturally wanted an Aston to highlight Fleming's story. John Steers and Ken Adam were attracted by Aston's most glamorous model at the time, the DB4 GT Zagato, and believed it would be a natural fit for Zorro 7. However, the sheer rarity of the things, only 19 were made, along with the difficulty of convincing Aston Martin to loan cars over at all, meant that a gadget-equipped Zagato wasn't going to happen. Eventually, the DB5 prototype and production cars were sent over to Pinewood Studios, and as they say, the rest is history. As with all the Bond films and the industry in general, along with the great cars and gadgets that were famous, there were also some which didn't make the final cut, and are only known to true Bond geeks who look behind the scenes. Such items include a telephone in the driver's door and a draw under the seat which kept a series of weapons, including a knife, hand grenade, a magnum revolver, and a Mauser automatic gun complete with its own silencer. These are relatively minor things compared to those that did make the cut. And given the story couldn't fully evolve around the famous Aston, it's understandable that out of the gadgets that weren't used on screen, these would be it. Ken Adams' head simply kept spiraling with ideas when it came to planning Goldfinger, and perhaps understandably so, some of his ideas were not made and fitted. Two spotlights that would sit in the front grille would conceal flamethrowers, and the rear taillights would shoot out three-pronged nails onto the road which would puncture pursuing vehicles. A modified version of the latter was used to great effect in No Time to Die, but for Goldfinger, this simply wouldn't go further forward. Speaking of flamethrowers, some crazy person decided to apply one to a Lada. The result is quite terrifying. As filming for Goldfinger was to get underway later in 1964, John Steers was under pressure to convert DP-2161 into a world fighting machine at a speedy pace. Deconstructing a car worth P4500 in 1964, roughly $100,000 in today's money, was a finger-biting task to perform never mind fitting gadgets which weren't designed for the DB5 and putting it back together again. Nevertheless, the team at Pinewood managed to finish the car in just six weeks before sending it back to Aston to have it painted in silver birch. Pulling off that task would be impossible today, and since Aston decided to recreate a Goldfinger continuation car for their customers' pleasure, you can imagine building one of those takes quite a bit longer. What would perhaps take even longer than that is the coach-built Rolls-Royce boat tail, which costs an estimated 25 miller. After Goldfinger and succeeding Thunderball had wrapped up, DP-2161 was stripped of its famous gadgets 
and sold on as the bond producers were keener on using different cars, including the Toyota 2000 GT in You Only Live Twice and the DBS in On Her Majesty's Secret Service. The car was later refitted with the gadgets before going through a series of collectors until a sale in 1986 at a sum of $250,000. The buyer was memorabilia collector Anthony Pugliese III, who insured it for $4.2 million. What happened next remains somewhat of a mystery for over 25 years. Pugliese stored the car in a storage hangar at Boca Raton Airport in Florida, and on the night of June 18, 1997, thieves broke into the unit and escaped with the car in their possession. Tire marks suggested the car was dragged to a cargo plane before taking off. The car was never to be seen in the public eye again, but Art Recovery International have been investigating the case and believe the world-famous Aston is currently residing in the Middle East, with a possible likelihood that the possessor isn't even aware of the car's theft. Christopher Marinello, founder of ARI, is said to be pursuing an agreement with the car's current possessor, whereby they can come to an agreement without releasing details to the public. Let's just hope they come to an arrangement. In Pierce Brosnan's first outing as James Bond in 1995, the first scene after the opening credits revealed that the most famous Bond car was back in action. The DB5 was made without the revolving number plates and rear bullet shield, and instead had a champagne cooler. A classy tone down, you could say. The registration plate was different too. It displayed BMT 214A, replacing the 6 with a 4. But rather more worrying for the producers was a rather nasty accident with a then-new Ferrari F355 GTS. Whilst filming a shot where the Ferrari cuts a hairpin corner, it and the DB5 collided. The Ferrari was sent to a dealer in Monaco for repairs, and Aston's support team repaired the car overnight. Still, that couldn't have been a cheap repair, especially considering running the F355's successor, the 360, isn't exactly affordable. The DB5 returned for Daniel Craig's outing in Skyfall in 2012 in magnificent form. It sported the correct BMT 216A plate and even utilized its front machine guns to battle with Silva's henchmen. A painful sight considering how valuable they are these days. Upon reveal of the famous Aston in Bond's storage unit, the premiere screening saw audiences cheer for the Silver Birch DB5 as it made its return to the Bond franchise. In early cinema screenings, filmgoers were also reported applauding when the car was revealed. This social reaction from Bond fans puts perfect emphasis on why the DB5 is such an iconic machine. It's an iconic symbol of British history, and a machine that's more synonymous with 007 than anything else, even the other great cars in No Time to Die. The pre-title opening sequence in No Time to Die was the longest ever to feature in a Bond film. But when you have the DB5 to play with, you naturally have to give it enough screen time. The producers wanted a thrilling, action-packed sequence filled with guns, burnouts, and power slides. Since it was tricky to achieve what the brief had in mind with an original DB5, Aston Martin stepped up and made several custom-made replicas. They were constructed using carbon fiber and were more akin to WRC rally cars than a 60-year-old Grand Tourer. What's more, instead of the 4.0-liter Tadek Marek straight six, these stunt cars had 3.2-liter straight six engines from the E46 generation BMW M3. Being a higher revving unit, it probably made the cars a lot more maneuverable than the originals. It did result in a rather dynamic sequence in the end. 